welcome to Australia. This is one of the most fire-prone regions on Earth. And we're here at the peak of the wildfire season. Whoa, whoa, whoa! This all of a sudden flames erupted on this side of the road. We've been given incredible access to one of the world's biggest firefighting forces at its busiest time of the year. Every year, they battle thousands of fires in an area larger than France. We're following their operations to discover why wildfires are so frequent and so hard to control. Last time, we revealed how fires ignite and the astonishing ways they can spread. Ooh, it erupts at the bottom. The lightning channel generates a big pressure wave, and it's actually like fireballs. And we explored the vast infrastructure put in place to spot fires and stamp them out fast. You're standing here looking at battles mm. breaking out. In this program, we'll investigate why the wind can be a firefighter's worst enemy. This fire could go 40 kilometers or more, and it could actually impact on people's properties. We'll uncover the causes of the most extreme fires. By drawing air in just through those gaps, that causes the rotating motion that spins up to a high velocity. And we'll meet scientists unlocking the secrets of fire behavior to help those on the front line. We can already smell a little oh, look, bit of And breakdown. actually, it's starting to smoke. It's what slightly... is smoking? Lessons learned in Australia are helping firefighters across the world. Wildfires are one of the most powerful and terrifying events on the planet, and we're going to be going right to their heart. Wildfires are a global phenomenon, raging across six of the seven continents, wiping out millions of acres of land and affecting hundreds of thousands of people. And New South Wales is one of the worst affected areas on Earth. During the height of the wildfire season here, from October through to February, this state can be hit by more than 100 fires a day. We've come here in January. It's the peak of summer and the peak of the fire season. I'm with fire crews in the remote Wollomai National Park, working to bring a new fire under control. It's hardly rained here for 10 weeks, and with temperatures in the 30s and winds regularly in excess of 30 kilometers an hour, current conditions are perfect for wildfires. Krusty, how far are we from the fire now? Yes, Simon, the fire's about four kilometers to the east of it now. It's up on top of this broken uh, escarpment. David Crust, known as Krusty, is coordinating the firefighting response. There's a great fog of smoke down there, but I can see the fire through the trees. This is the biggest wildfire I've seen since I arrived. How do you think this fire started? This is a lightning strike from about eight days ago. And obviously it hit a tree, the tree ignited, and a branch has dropped out of the tree and it's ignited the fields underneath. So it's almost we... like a fire time bomb. Yeah. Burning away gently, quietly, and then all of a sudden it drops a branch and a fire erupts. That's why we have to be so vigilant. The fire was first spotted by Krusty two hours ago. When we got here this morning, it was making a run. What do you mean by that? Well, it had an uphill run, so it was pre-drying the fuels. It had the wind behind it, so the right. fire was really behaving quite intensely. The topography of the landscape it inhabits is a major influence on how a fire behaves. When a fire reaches an uphill slope, the heat and smoke rises, drying out vegetation ahead, which then ignites and burns more rapidly. The speed of a fire can double with every 10 degree increase in incline. So far, the fire has traveled six kilometers. The combination of wind and uphill terrain means it could easily gain momentum and spread much further. What are your concerns about this fire? What could go, what could happen with it? This fire could go 40 kilometers or more and it could actually impact on people's properties. 40 kilometers? Oh, it would travel 40 kilometers in a day, potentially, and then we'd have weeks and weeks of work to contain it. The potential speed at which this fire could travel means Krusty has called in aerial reinforcements from across the state to attack the fire front. 
We've got a bucket going in now, just beneath us. So the, the red helicopter is working with the ground crew. So the boys on the ground are on the radio, and they're calling in that drop, and um, they're talking him in. There he goes. He's dropping the water now. Look at the skill involved in that. It was real, absolute surgery. It was a surgical strike, really. So you've had how many helicopters on this today? Six helicopters here today. Six helicopters, and how many how many uh, firefighters on the ground? Got over 20 guys on the ground working very hard to stay on top of this. Each bucket can scoop up as much as 650 litres of water. They take it from wherever they can get it. Creeks, rivers, billabongs, and even people's swimming pools. Dropping water from aircraft was pioneered by the Canadians during the Second World War and adopted by the Australians in the 1960s. To cope with this year's fire season, the RFS have had to expand their water bombing fleet from 26 to 138. And that's the most effective method of getting a fire out. Absolutely, it's all about getting water on the ground. Even if they manage to bring the fire under control this afternoon, the logistical challenges of getting firefighters into this remote location mean it could take days to extinguish. And this is just one of three fires within the park they're tackling at the moment. Already this season, the firefight in the Wallamai has cost almost five million pounds. This has been a really busy fire season. There's been a lot of fires and large areas burned. So now this is a one in 10 year event. One in 10 year event. So you haven't seen it like this for nearly a decade? No, the, the, the conditions are just so dry. Been, uh, we've been at this for about 12 weeks straight now, so it's been yeah, tough. Yeah. It sounds exhausting. Uh, yeah, we're all looking forward to some rain and a rest. While Krusty's team use water bucketing to control the fire in the Wallamai, 100 kilometers to the southwest, firefighters near the city of Bathurst are also dumping water on flames, but on a much bigger scale. This fire is one of three in the area started by a lightning storm. Winds have been gusting at 40 kilometers per hour and have driven the fire to within 30 kilometers of Bathurst and its population of 38,000. The winds are expected to return this afternoon, and with people at risk, heli bucketing alone isn't sufficient defence. So they've called in the most effective water dropping weapon in the rural fire service fleet. With a top speed of 200 kilometers per hour and a range of 400 kilometers, the Sky Crane is unrivaled in its ability to get right to the heart of a fire fast and effectively. There are three in active service across New South Wales. They deliver the equivalent of 14 heli buckets of water in one hit. They're deployed daily across the state to attack whichever fires pose most threat to life and property. It's out here that you really see Sky Crane come into its own. It looks like such an unwieldy beast of a machine, but in the hands of a skilled pilot, it's incredibly maneuverable. So he's coming in now to the dam to refill, and he hovers like a giant dragonfly above the water, and you can see the snorkel going in sucking up that 9,000 meters in seconds. And off he goes, following the line of the valley and approaching the area of the forest that is still smoking. There are flames beneath the canopy. And then he does his drop a great curtain of water hitting the smoke with astonishing accuracy. It's hoped that the sky crane can reduce the size of the fire before the winds pick up later. 
just a two-fold increase in wind speed could quadruple the rate at which the fire spreads. To find out more about why wind is such a critical factor in fire behaviour, I'm going back to the Rural Fire Service headquarters in Sydney. From here, they're monitoring the hundreds of fires that can occur at any one time. They make minute-by-minute -minute decisions about where to send aerial resources like the Sky Crane and a 70,000-strong crew of volunteer firefighters. Key to this process is in-house weather forecaster Simon Lewis. Weather really is critical for determining fire behaviour and fire activity. Um, so we look at the temperature, how dry it is, how windy it is. We're expecting an easterly surge in the winds just over the southern ranges tomorrow. The stronger the winds we get, the faster that pushes the fire flanks along. Um, and so you get faster rates of fire spread. To understand the impact of wind on a fire, you first need to know that all fires move with a common shape and that it's not a straight line. The hottest and quickest moving part of the fire is known as the front, while the sides or flanks burn more slowly and less intensely. Once a fire has ignited, the wind can control the speed at which it moves and determine in which direction it travels. For Simon, keeping a close eye on wind direction, especially any sudden changes, is vital. One of the things I will do in here is um, track the position um, of wind changes as they move across the state. And I'll also monitor when we're expecting those to reach particular fire grounds, which is really important for firefighter safety. For Rob Rogers, the man in charge of operations at the Rural Fire Service, a rapidly changing wind is his worst nightmare. You'll get firefighters operating on a, on a side of a fire because often when it's really burning very hot, you can't put it at the front. It's just too dangerous, mm. so they'll, they'll go on the, what we call the flanks of the fire. If there's a sudden wind change and the side becomes the front and you've got people sitting there, um, it's, a, it's a really dangerous area and they, they call it the dead man zone. Um, because look, in the past there has been firefighters killed in that sort of circumstance. It was a sudden shift in wind direction that helped to create one of the worst fires Australia has ever seen. Simon's going to meet a couple who managed to survive the full force of this blaze to discover just how rapidly a fire can change its behaviour. Let me just show you this, actually. You see the sign here? They have these outside almost every community in this part of Australia. It's such a graphic illustration of the threat. Everybody's conscious of it. Fire danger today, very high. It was extremely hot conditions like this that led to huge numbers of fires in the neighbouring state of Victoria on Saturday the 7th of February 2009. More than 300 grass and bush fires swept across the state and around the city of Melbourne and its population of 4 million. One fire which began at Kilmore East was being driven southeasterly by strong winds. 30 kilometres away was the town of King Lake West. Ruth, Jason, hello. Home to Jason and Ruth Lynn and their two children. They'd lived in King Lake West for 12 years. Weather conditions that day were exceptional, with temperatures in excess of 40 degrees by 11 a.m. It was the hottest day ever ever I've seen up here, and the wind, you could hardly even stand up. Oh. It was that strong, the wind. With the fire closing in on their house, the couple had to make a stark choice, evacuate or stay and prepare to defend their home. When you've got two children, one still in nappies, you've got to make a, a serious decision right on the spot and think, well, what am I going to do? So I decided I had to go. Ruth put the kids in the car and headed away from their home, but Jason decided to stay and defend. I'd seen it come from that direction. I could hear it first, like a storm, and the roar, and things actually starting to explode. It wasn't much smoke at all, it was just fire. It was all riding on the top, and it was like 
the air was on fire as well. But you could, I can still almost smell it. It's like a um, the burning oil, burning eucalyptus that was like above the trees on fire. Jason is describing what's known as a crowning fire. Flames leap from the ignited leaf litter on the ground up to the treetops. Exposed to the full force of the wind, fire then spreads at terrifying speeds across the canopy, up to four times faster than a ground fire. At around six o'clock that evening, the wind changed direction, blowing the fire eastward. And the flanks of the fire, stretching up to 55 kilometers in length, suddenly became a huge fire front heading straight for King Lake West. I seen the hay shed go up, and then when it got really intense, I was actually using the hose against the wind just to, to stop myself from... Perishing. Yeah, just being burnt, you know? I was just holding it, like, at the flames, or at the front as it kept coming, and by now there's a lot of embers and stuff starting to come as well. Just holding it, yeah, and then turning around again and trying to spray the house, because it was just drying on it. That's when my hose failed. With some fires traveling up to 600 meters in 30 seconds, the fire wreaked devastation through community after community. Thick black smoke in some areas meant water bucketing helicopters were grounded. Everything's on fire. I couldn't think of anywhere else I could shelter. I headed for the dam and I crawled down until I could feel the water and I turned around backwards and went in backwards with my head out just on the bank and that's where I just laid there. As soon as the fire had passed through, a major rescue operation was underway in the most appalling conditions. I remember the voices and then I heard him say, there's someone down here. And I couldn't hardly move, but I remember the feeling of the gloves they wear on my face. And he held my hand and he said, can you squeeze my hand? And I squeezed his hand. And he said, if you can squeeze my hand, it means you'll make it. <laughs> yeah. There's very few natural events that could transport you so immediately mm. from mm. paradise to hell, really. Yeah. That's yeah. right, yeah. Jason is extremely lucky to have survived an event that has become known as Black Saturday. Throughout Victoria, 173 people lost their lives and more than 2,000 homes were destroyed. The sudden wind change was one of the factors that made the fire so hard to control. And it wasn't only residents that were caught out. Many firefighters also found their escape routes cut off. Six fire trucks were caught in burnovers when the fire front passed directly over them, engulfing the trucks in flames. Fortunately, all the firefighters inside survived. The incident motivated Australian scientists to carry out the kind of critical research Kate's on her way to see at the Rural Fire Service Hot Fire Testing Centre in Mogo. This is a Cat 7 fire truck. There are 1,200 in active service throughout New South Wales. Today, lead researcher Justin Leonard is using the only bushfire simulator of its kind in the world to subject the Cat 7 to an artificial burnover. He's invited me to join him while he measures the levels of heat and smoke within the vehicle. These indicators help to assess what conditions are like for firefighters as a fire strikes. But this is the first time he's done it with anyone actually seated inside the cab. It's quite odd. Mental process preparing yourself to knowingly go into a burning truck, or at least one that's going to be close enough to be very, very hot and uncomfortable. I have no idea what it's going to be like. I know, I don't, you know, you know about radiation about radiated heat you light a fire at home you can feel it but the idea of being stuck 
in a very small confined space with the heat ever increasing is terrifying. Justin has placed a number of sensors around this fire engine to monitor temperatures in and out of the cab and keep us safe. 41 gas burners surrounding the truck will recreate the different stages of the burnover. Right, how are you feeling? Um, a bit nervous. My, I wouldn't say my heart rate's at uh, resting pace as mm. right now. No, mine neither. <laughs> <laughs> Should we get it over with? Yeah, good luck. Thank you, you too. Let us know how you're feeling in terms of the uh, radiant heat load on your skin. Okay. Okay, Martin, we're uh, ready for the low stage of the burners. Okay, Justin, here we go. Instant. It's an instant. The heat through the glass. Yep. My heart rate's definitely up. The scenario Justin is simulating now is stage one of a burnover when flames are approaching the truck. So we're seeing quite a filtered um, amount of heat coming through. So that's getting about half a kilowatt. Okay. And we've got about 2.5 outside. Right. So this is sort of um, already significantly hotter than a hot sunny day. Yeah. But, but tolerable. Tolerable, yeah. I mean, it is like standing on bonfire night. It's like standing, you know, kind of close enough, but thinking, hmm, once I've got my baked potato, I might take a step back. That's right. Feel like uh, going up a notch? Yeah, go on then. Okay, so bring it up to the next level, Martin. Okay. Okay, that's now, now, now feeling the heat's building, yep. really, I'm, I'm kind of, I can feel myself kind of just leaning away from the window, definitely, even an, even just a few centimetres makes a difference. We can already smell a little oh, look, bit of and breakdown. And actually it's starting to smoke. So slightly, what is smoking? Slightly cloudy inside the truck. So I'd say the plastic elements on outside the truck are starting to be a bit... Um, oh, it happened, yeah, I can see. Yeah. Do you want to briefly go up a notch just before um, the truck gets a little bit too hot and burnt? Okay. <laughs> okay, yeah. go up one more notch. Okay. Okay, so we're now at, oh wow, so, okay. So the outside radiant heat is five and a half now, yeah. inside. So you'd, you'd now be feeling quite a lot of pain potentially it's, on your skin. You can't We've actually... pretty much got two, two kilowatts on us now. Okay, yeah, you can't actually turn and look at the, look at, if looking at you, it's more comfortable. We're, we're pretty much at the threshold and now the smoke's getting a bit the high. The smoke's so, quite high. Okay, shut down because there's a fair bit of smoke coming in the cabin. I'd say we're better off climbing out. Okay, okay. This kind of testing is vital for offering firefighters who use Cat 7s the best advice in the event of a burnover. If we hadn't got out when we did, what would have happened? We could see, feel a tingle in our mouths. Yeah. And it was like we were, we were 10 to 20 seconds away from that being really irritating. At about 30 seconds, our eyes would have been really sore and, you know, we'd be feeling quite headachy, say, for, for a few hours after that exposure if we didn't get out exactly when right. we did. Firefighters are trained to stay in the cab, close all windows and vents, get low and cover themselves with a woolen blanket. OK, we're ready. We can uh, bring on the uh, pre-radiation burners on level one. the Cat 7 will now be subjected to the second stage of the burnover when the truck is engulfed in flames. The wheels are igniting. Okay, so main burner's on now. What? Oh my goodness. So this is the main frame, flame front now going to engulf, engulf this side of the, the vehicle. Just moved to the offside burner, so the fire front's actually okay, burning so over is, the truck. This is now, now replicating uh, a fire doing the literal burn over, crossing right. over the truck. So it's as if you're on a track with fuel on, and trees built up on both sides, so the fire front actually moves fully over the top of the truck. Plain to see the impact side, which came from that side. Sorry. 
<laughs> that, that'll be a tyre. That's tyre number that's one. A tire. Okay, we'll get suppression ready. Tests like these identify where the key safety advances need to be made. Well, I'm not sure you're going to be able to use this one again, Andrew. Oh. Wow, it's like a horror film, isn't it? It is, isn't it? What chills me the most is that volunteer firefighters are in these vehicles yeah. and um, we want to make sure that they never get into this situation. What were the obvious things that you said, OK, there is serious room for improvement in this, in this particular uh, scenario? Yep, it's, it's the windows. As you saw, the windows are all gone. Yep. Um, that allows too much flame, etc., to enter. The doors, where the flame impacts on the door, melts everything inside, starts to put a lot of smoke inside the cab so you can't breathe. Yeah. The other thing is all of the rubbers and any fuel under the cab. So tyres, that tires, kind of thing. plastics, anything that will cause flame to propagate is a fuel which will then impact inside the cab. So if we look at the, the newer model, um, I mean, obviously, it's a much bigger vehicle altogether. Does size matter? Not when it comes to crew protection, Kate. No, it doesn't. Just to explain a couple of things that we've done and some of the weak points that we saw on the older vehicle compared to this one. We have a ring main at the top, and those sprays up the top there are actually sheeting water down each window, so it keeps the glass very cool. We have a, another spray under here. The tyres will be wet and kept cool. We change the plastics and we change these to metal. All Everything's of that's metal. metal. One more feature that we do on here, plastic door handles. Yeah. This is all metal now. So we replace that with metal as well. Ah. And I'm assuming the blinds inside the windows are not decorative. Oh, well, OK. This reflecting back the radiant heat away from the inside of the cab. Exactly. That in itself means that anyone trapped in a burnover in this vehicle has every reason to survive. Well, they have a, a much greater chance of survivability than what they do in any other vehicle. Right. These new trucks will themselves be tested in a continual process to create ever safer vehicles. Throughout any fire season, there are peaks and troughs of activity, and the situation can vary in different parts of this vast state according to the particular weather conditions. Back at Bathurst, it's been much cooler in the past few days, bringing rain that has helped keep the fires under control. At the Wallamai, temperatures remain in the 30s. The fires there have now burnt through 470 square kilometres of wilderness. While the air team continue to drop water on the fire, ground teams in the park are now employing the next step in their firefighting strategy. It's called containment, and it involves using bulldozers to clear vegetation ahead of a fire to remove the fuel it needs to burn and spread. I've joined John Gracie in the driving seat. OK. Are you right for this? Yeah. Good for it. You knock it down. Takes it down like it's a matchstick. Oh, the power of this machine! Does a good job for size. The thing is, you don't even feel it here in the cab, do you? It, it, it's there's no pause; it just goes straight through and over. Each firebreak is around three to five meters wide. So as well as restricting the fire, they can also provide an access road for fire trucks. What they're doing obviously isn't as sexy as fighting the fire from a helicopter or from the sky, but it's an essential part of preventing and stopping the fires that ravage these areas. And they can fight the fire on their terms. While scientists and firefighters are constantly evolving better methods to control and contain wildfires, there's one fire that is so formidable it simply can't be contained.
In January 2003, a massive fire hit Canberra, Australia's capital city, engulfing 2,600 square kilometres in a single day. It was a huge fire, but what made it unusual was that it created a massive spinning vortex of flame. This phenomenon has been described as a giant fire whirl or fire tornado. Local residents Gary and Trish witnessed it firsthand. The sky was blood red, and then it just started, just this big swirling type of black smoke it appeared over there. Shortly after that, I saw one of those big gum trees at the top of the mountain snap, and that went like about 50 metres up in the air across the mountain and then disappeared at the back so there it somewhere. So it was behaving exactly like a tornado. It was lifting stuff yeah. up and chucking it in the air. Yeah. Then all of a sudden we saw that huge fireball. It was like an explosion of fire. We have lost Get in, mate. Quick step. The Canberra tornado proved that fires are capable of creating their own extreme weather systems as dangerous as the fire itself. Exactly what leads to this kind of event is debated by scientists. But fire behaviour expert Jason Forthofer has developed an ingenious method to demonstrate one way they can be caused. We lit these five different fires and each fire is trying to suck air into the base of it to replace the hot air that's rising. The only air that it can really draw in well is through these gaps between the fires. And by drawing air in just through those gaps, that causes the rotating motion, and then that rotating motion is stretched and causes this fire whirl that spins up to a high velocity. To grow, fires need a constant supply of oxygen, and they do this by sucking in air at their base. Fire whirls can occur when a number of fires burn in close proximity and compete for air, creating a circular airflow. This can happen in wildfires when spotting fires caused by flying embers ignite around the main fire front. Using high-speed cameras, we can see how the flame behaves in intricate detail. Slowed right down to a 20th of normal speed, you can see the central flame spin and then stretch vertically. The rising hot air acts on that rotating motion. It spins up into a really tight whirl. In the real world, these fire whirls can get up to be 100 miles an hour or more. They've been known to tear roofs off houses and tip cars over. Subsequent analysis of the Canberra tornado revealed that the fire created its own superheated winds travelling at 250 kilometres per hour. Given the unstoppable power of tornadoes like this, Jason's research is focused on providing an early warning system. Our hope with our research is that we can give firefighters insight into likely locations where they may form and then also to be aware when they do form the kind of damage that they can do. For Canberra residents Gary and Trish, it's an experience they're unlikely to forget. It just happened so quick, dropped everything, ran in the house, 30 seconds later, boom. It just it just, and it just, uh, hit. just hit and, and it, it just that noise, incredible jet engine noise was just roaring out. Um, fireball had been God, a couple God. of metres or whatever mm. more towards the house. I, yeah, I would hate to think what happened. What eventually halted the tornado is uncertain, but it lasted for an hour, travelling 40 kilometres before finally dying out. Back in Bathurst, New South Wales, the recent rainfall has helped to suppress the flames and wind speeds have dropped, allowing firefighters to get the upper hand. The fires are now under control. While the conditions are calmer, there's a brief opportunity to enter the scorched firegrounds and make sure any remaining hotspots are completely extinguished. I'm joining the mopping up operation. At the moment, we've got the blacking out mopping up operations, which is basically going in getting any hot spots, any bits of fire that may be underground, in tree stumps, in, uh, in trunks of trees, etc., making sure that they're completely extinguished. The crews out there today will actually be off the trucks, walking through the burnt ground, 
feeling for any any heat that's coming up out of the ground. Wow. Is this a dangerous operation? Any operation, any time is always dangerous. We've got falling trees, especially with a bit of wind. Trees that are fire damaged can fall at any time. Uh, the bush is dry, so if anything starts from an ember, it's going to spread fairly quickly. So everyone has to be alert that Ev fire could reignite at yep. any time. Well, we'll uh, go and see what they do. Yes, let's go. Crews work eight-hour shifts, covering the ground systematically. You need eagle eyes, and it also helps to have an infrared camera like Chris's. Kate, perhaps just have a look at this one. <laughs> Got a bit of a hot spot here. Oh, my goodness, yeah. yeah. <laughs> wow, over 300 degrees. Yeah, we cracked the 300 degree mark. And you'd never know. I mean, I was heading down for the very obvious hot spots, the smoking yeah. areas. Would never, ever have considered this. Right. The FLIR cameras were first used by the Rural Fire Service in 2008 and are now indispensable to frontline fire detection. It really is helping us do things that you ordinarily might not see. And if you did miss things like this, how dangerous are they? Uh, well, it depends a bit on the weather conditions, but this is a risky slope um, because the unburnt is on the upslope side. Uh, and we've got quite a bit of leaf fall, which will happen. So you need to kind of nip this in the bud, yes. basically, before it becomes another, as yeah. you say, flashpoint. So we'll expose it with a rake in a minute, so mm -hmm. you can do a bit of raking. OK, yeah, okay. put me to work. And then we'll bring the hose line down, lay a bit of foam on it, so we take the heat out of it. Yeah. So you're exposing the fuel, removing the heat, smothering it with, with a bit of foam. OK. So that's your, heat tri that's your triangle. Fuel, right. heat, air. So Get rid of them. Got rid of all those things. Yep. Right, OK, you better put me to work. Who's got a rake? <laughs> a hot spot like this is formed when a fire has spread into the roots of a tree and continues to burn beneath the ground. That's certainly gone into an active flame stage because it's exposed to the air. Right. A little bit of air movement, upslope, yep. and away it goes. Wow, it does boil up, doesn't it? It's yes. Just it's like a bit of a frothing Taking the heat out. Sometimes we've got to be a bit cautious with how much water we use. Probably no nothing much over 30 there now. Brilliant. OK. Yep. So, um, one down. How many more do you reckon there are to go? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's the question. <laughs> You're good at picking lotto coupons too. <laughs> Chris and his colleagues continue to work until nightfall and they'll be back again tomorrow. It's incredible to imagine that across New South Wales they have to repeat this process with thousands upon thousands of individual fires throughout the season. Every year, on average, Wildfires burn through half a million square kilometres of Australia. And because wildfires have been part of the natural cycle here for millions of years, the native plants have had to evolve extraordinary adaptations to survive being repeatedly scorched. One of Australia's leading ecologists, Tina Bell, studies the regeneration of forests after wildfires. I'm meeting her in the Blue Mountains National Park, just outside the town of Winmalee, to see exactly what happens. You're an ecologist. I would have thought that uh, fire would be a kind of nightmare for you. No, no, it's the best thing that can happen. Um, it just shows you how dynamic a forest can be. In one way or another, every species in this forest is dependent on fire for regeneration, either from a new individual as a seed or new sprouts from a tree that looked dead before. Only three months ago, fire ripped through here, burning everything in its way. If you come here the day after, it would have been just black. So all this greenery that we're seeing now coming out of the ground or sprouting out of the trees has happened since the fire? Absolutely. You know, you can see some green within a week after the fire. There are flowers, Tina. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> and that's one of the features that this plant uses to survive in this area. You know, grow, 
fast after a fire, be one of the first flowers around and you've got the best chance of being pollinated. There's nothing else for insects to feed on here. What form would it have been effectively dormant in? What this plant uses is an underground tuber and just being a couple of centimetres below the ground is enough to protect it from the heat. But whilst nature has adapted to tolerate fire, certain species actually need fire to survive. This is a banksia. A banksia? Yes, it's um, a common species around this area. And what this is, is it's seed pod, and the seeds are protected from the fire in there. Normally they're closed up, and this is covered in um, fur, and it looks like a mouse with a bad hair day. <laughs> <laughs> but the fire comes through, burns it off, kills this branch, and that's yeah. enough to um, open up these follicles here, and the seed can pop out. If you look around, you'll be able to find a seedling or so. Ah. That's the one there. It's come straight from the parent tree onto the ground and germinated. So this whole species of plant is totally dependent on fire to be able to regenerate? Yes, yes. That's the only way we'll get new plants of this particular tree. The ability of plants to evolve in this way provides an astonishing illustration of just how fundamentally wildfire and the Australian landscape are linked. And in the same way that plants have developed ways of living with fire, so the people who inhabit this land must continually develop more sophisticated technology to allow them to live with it too. As our time in New South Wales comes to an end, I'm keen to know what the future of firefighting holds. To find out, I'm meeting Professor Kevin Tolhurst from the University of Melbourne, an expert in fire ecology and management who spent his career studying fire behaviour. He's created what could become the future of wildfire prediction across the world. It's known as Phoenix Rapid Fire. We've got a huge screen in front of us, but Kevin, can I ask, what, what is Phoenix Rapid Fire? Phoenix Rapid Fire is a computer program that predicts the spread and the nature of fire. So for every point across the landscape, it'll tell you how high the flames are, how fast the fire's moving, how many embers are being produced, and it gives you a, a spatial and temporal description of fire across the landscape. So you're able to predict what I would think of as being unpredictable, a wildfire. But fires aren't unpredictable. Fires still follow the laws of science. So whether it's physics or chemistry that's involved in, in fire behaviour, you just need to understand what those relationships are and how they interact. Is there a button you can press to start it up to, so we can see what's going to happen? Well, we can run the model. So what we're seeing displayed here is how the fire is spreading across the landscape. To model a fire in real time, all Kevin needs to do is enter the location of the fire and the time it started. The computer then cross-references this info with a live weather feed and stored data about topography, fire history and vegetation to map the fire. So the computer has just churned the data and now it's mapping it. The different colours are showing the activity of the fire. So the purple areas are showing where the fire has self-extinguished, gone out. Yellow-brown colours are showing the relative flame height. What makes the model truly groundbreaking is that it can also predict how fire will spread up to six hours ahead. Because of the strong southerly wind, a significant growth of the fire to the north. Knowing that this is the potential of the fire, you would then allocate your resources in such a way to make sure that the, the area of greatest impact is prevented. So this is important intelligence or important information for planning by the fire agencies. And if you can't stop it, then it's really important to make sure you advise the community that uh, what they're likely to be impacted by so that they can take appropriate action to defend themselves. Phoenix Rapid Fire is able to predict fire behaviour with 90% accuracy. And that accuracy means that it's now being used at the Rural Fire Service HQ. On the main central command board is an ominous column entitled Time to Impact. This is the time that remains before a wildfire will hit a community. As Kevin's model proves its worth here, it's gradually being introduced in other wildfire-affected parts of the world. With more and more houses being built on land prone to fires, tools like this will help to protect them. And there's another reason why all of the firefighting technology we've seen in Australia is becoming more vital. There's a lot of concern in Australia 
that our climate is changing. Are you seeing any evidence of that in the fires that you study? The climate change that we're seeing really is accentuating the extremes of conditions and what we can see in modelling and fire behaviour is it's the extreme conditions that drive these large fire events and because the frequency is increasing therefore we're seeing more severe fires. And as a consequence of that we're going to basically um, find that people will not only see a bushfire once in their lifetime, they may see it two or three times in their lifetime. So in the past we've been very quick at trying to rebuild a neighbourhood, rebuild our house, rebuild our lives in the same way as it was before to say we can overcome this, we can uh, rule over, the, over nature. But the reality is that with increasing severity of uh, weather and associated fires, that's going to be a folly. So we actually need to uh, be even better prepared for, for fire because it's going to be a, a more regular occurrence. with fires expected to grow fiercer and the population of this fire-prone state predicted to grow by another million before 2020. The need to better understand wildfire and how to control it is ever more pressing. As we've seen, scientists are working with firefighters to make sure everyone stays one step ahead of the flames. The battle to protect this magnificent landscape and the people who live here against those wildfires will go on. <laughs>